Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. It's a huge uh, pleasure to be here with everyone uh, in the Bay Area this evening. And uh, the topic and the question, can we eat our way out of climate change, is, is really pressing. You'll be aware that COP27, bringing together of nations from the entire world, is meeting in Egypt at the moment to find agreement and to shape a way forward to tackle climate change. And on the topic of food supply, those of us who are working at the interface between science, evidence, and policy, we are very aware that COP26 last year in the UK did not really address the issues of climate and food. So this is a great opportunity, and we're very grateful to the Commonwealth Club to give us this opportunity to bring food and climate uh, much more strongly into the public discourse. And uh, thank you, Peter Dillon, for being available and uh, joining us this evening. And um, I'd like to dive right in. Um, we know that food supply is creating about a third of human greenhouse gas emissions that are impacting global climate. And from the commercial sharp end, um, how is the food industry viewing this? Um, are they aware of it? How are they tackling it? What are some of the issues that you see from the commercial side that are, are pressing? Uh, thanks for the question, Steve. Uh, let me first uh, start off by thanking the Commonwealth Club uh, for hosting tonight and thanking the University of Leeds alumni for organizing this event. This is the first event that I'm doing uh, with the University of Leeds and I'm excited to be here. Uh, your question around commercialization and climate change around food, I think um, uh, a couple of different comments uh, on that. I think today, um, food companies, Farmers are starting to wake up to the fact that um, they can't continue doing things the same way for different reasons. And I think there's a point in time where consumers start looking at uh, food and agriculture and saying, are you doing your part uh, in, in regards to climate change? You're, you're absolutely right. The number uh, is about a third or 25% to a third of greenhouse gases come from the production of food. And, uh, and it's an industry that's uh, been not really focused in on. But I think as we move forward and, and we're seeing climate coming up time and time again, uh, and, and we're feeling it and we're seeing it uh, every day, uh, changing in our communities. Uh, so as, as climate is becoming a big conversation, uh, I think it's a, just a matter of time where uh, people start focusing on, on, on the production of food and what are we going to do differently and doing our part as farmers, as growers, to make the planet uh, a little bit healthier. What are some of the important drivers of change that you think are going to perhaps shape, uh, shape that transition? Um, is it gonna be consumer demand? Is it gonna be brand value? Is it gonna be just financial risk that of getting it wrong in the future? What are some of the things that are, what are some of the discussions sure. at board level that are? Well, I'll tell you, we're saying first and foremost, um, on this continent, we're seeing food production decreasing because climate is changing. Uh, what we're experiencing today is completely different than having consistent weather 20 years ago. Uh, I'm from Vancouver. Last year, we had a, something called a heat dome. And I don't know if any of you know what a heat dome is, but no, well, I figured it out last year when we were sitting in 40 plus degrees Celsius. This year, uh, we have atmospheric rivers. And these are expressions that we just never heard. And now we're hearing it. So we're seeing a whipsaw um, of weather patterns that are changing the entire food production on the continent. And food companies and cooperatives are getting together and saying, you know, we're, we're now seeing a reduction in food uh, in, in crops, and we're seeing at the same time record demand for food. And, you know, we're all seeing it at the grocery store where we're seeing an inflation on price. But, you know, going back, it's, it's really going to be a shift in mindset that I, I think here as we see climate change, we see supply chain issues, we really need to shift a mindset on how we grow food. 
and how we've been doing it conventionally, we've been causing climate damage, is not the same pattern going forward. And, and you know, people from California know that better than anybody. Uh, the water shortages that are here, you know? You think that here's California as a state right next to the Pacific Ocean. There shouldn't be a water issue, and there's a big water issue. And I think it's a resource that we haven't really paid a lot of attention to, but we're going to be paying a lot of attention to, and I think California is a wake-up call. Is, is carbon markets, the, uh, is that something that could help here, or what, where will the incentives come from for this, for this kind of change that you're talking about being required? You know, I was a part of a discussion uh, on carbon credits, and, and people think that there's a real market there. I, for me personally, I think if we want to continue to eat and not pay astronomic prices, for me, there's a social reason to do this, okay. and, and we need to make that shift. Okay. In a community, if you are out talking to consumers, you're talking to households, what would be messages you could give to them in terms of what, what ought they to be changing in their diet or their purchasing patterns that would help? Yeah, um, so there, I, I think what we're going to see going forward is um, more localized production. And, and uh, what I mean by that is um, many, many, many areas rely on exports. California is a big exporter of food. But um, when you look at food security, uh, what does that really mean? And to me, you know, to be a food secure nation, you need to be less dependent on others to provide your food production. So I think um, local production shifting uh, away from convention, convention will still be a big part of production, but switching to new ways of growing food, more on a localized basis. It's ridiculous today that food is grown, transported a thousand miles to get processed, then driven back. And, uh, and it's just, and it's awful. And then what you get is so much food waste when you're moving food there and moving it back. And, you know, that's a, that's a conversation that is, um, you know, as we look into this, it's, it's just quite shocking the amount of food that gets wasted just at the farm level. And we've got to be um, much more aware of, of that. I, I sit in my academic ivory tower, and I'm not a business person. And the way I imagine you, you know, one of the ways you grow value in a company is you grow market share, you grow volume. And to me, for food, that implies if you're going to grow volume, that that requires more resources. That's probably going to require more diesel fuel for your machinery in the field, um, possibly more transport in those supply chains. Are there some ways that we can add value without having that increase in primary resource use? Because in the end, mm -hmm. that's driving a lot of the climate change. Sure, yeah, absolutely, 100% agree with you. Uh, I, I think farmers today need more flexibility. And, and first of all, farmers got to be prepared and willing to make the shift as well. Um, you know, my, my peers in, in, in growing food, agriculture, um, everybody loves to keep things the way they are. And everything around us is changing. And as farmers and growers, we're going to have to change as well. But I think uh, if we can accept that, uh, then I think uh, it, the flexibility that's, that's needed, that we should be able to do perhaps a little bit more on our land to um, move forward to the goal of uh, food security. And, you know, I've kind of throw it out there. What does food security mean? And, you know, you, Steve, you may have a different definition of it, and I'm sure people in the room will have a definition. For me, food security is really begins at the farm, but it doesn't end at the farm. And I think um, what I've heard over the last little while is people think it begins and ends at the farm. It doesn't, for, in my opinion anyways. It begins at the farm, but it ends at the shelf, uh, the retail shelf, where almost 100% of consumers buy their food. And so everything in between the farm and the shelf, all that work needs to be done and um, to make sure that we get food to the shelf, to the consumers. And I think when we went through the pandemic, that was the first time that uh, we saw shelves going bare. and. People get very concerned. 
and get very scared when their shelves go empty. And we start seeing that in the pandemic. So we're gonna need the farmers because we're gonna need that security of food supply. And what strikes me, I guess I, I get a little bit defensive about farming. I come from a farm family. Much of my extended family continues to farm in the US Midwest. The University of Leeds runs a commercial farm under huge pressure right now. Uh, because of the cost of inputs, fertilizer, and, and everything else. Um, so we're expecting food, you know, that supply to be secure, that the nutrition is going to be available on the shelf that you mentioned. We're expecting that farmers are going to somehow do this magically and cut greenhouse gas emissions the way they farm, that they're going to provide nutrition that reduces our burden of disease, but improve dietary health. We want to reduce water pollution mm -hmm. from farm chemicals and things like that. So like, I, I feel sometimes that the, the world expects everything from farmers, but they want food to be free as well. That supply chain from the farm to the shelf, that value seems like so little of it goes back into farmers. Are there ways that we can change that balance of where that value is and be able to incentivize farmers to make these changes? Yeah, um, I think farmers first got to be ready to make the change. Okay. But 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 I but I you know go back to what I said earlier. It, it's the flexibility to allow your farmers to do things perhaps a little differently, not conventionally. You know, vertical farms is an example of a potential industry that uh, they can grow so much more food on on less land and use less than a half a percent of the water, even less than that, mm -hmm. that would require in, in conventional. We, we've just got to think differently. And, you know, we were having a conversation 15 years ago. Um, if you were an owner of a gas station, it was a pretty neat business, not knowing that electric cars were coming around the corner. And guess what? Today, if you're a gas station owner, you're getting a little worried about your investment. And, and I kind of think uh, the same technology drive in food uh, vertical farms, uh, regenerative agriculture. There, there are shifts and changes. And we've got to embrace that. And, you know, not, and I think if we do, getting a more consistent supply of food um, in a local economy, uh, you don't see the whipsawing of prices, and I think you see more reliability on food production and getting it to, to the retail market. What, how do we... How do we get that change of mindset in the farmers? What, I mean, to me, it, a part of it is going to be the perception of perhaps financial risk of making a change. Um, but what are some of the barriers that perhaps you're aware of through your suppliers that, you know, some of the challenges you face in getting them to, to, make, to make that change yeah. of mindset, to, to embrace we need to farm regeneratively as opposed to the way we've done it for two generations? Sure. I think you're right. I think fi financially, it, it's a it's a big cost for farmers to make that change, um, and and uh, the flexibility is important. But I think it's a generational thing too. Okay. I actually think um, as we look at young farmers, and I think that's a problem as well. And this is why I think the technology piece is exciting to me is that um, young people are leaving farms. They're not going to farms, and how do you get young people to come back and want to farm? And I think technology doing it differently is is much more exciting. And you know, um, I talk to a number of people in, in, in my community, and uh, we don't see many females participating in agriculture. And I think some of the new ideas of growing food differently, uh, moving away from conventional. I think you see a diversity of people wanting to actually grow food differently. You know, I was uh, in New York in 2019 at an ag tech conference, and uh, it, was f it was about 350 people, all young people, probably 30 and, and, and under. And I asked them, I go, well, you know, what do you guys do? And they said, we, we've, we're farmers. I said, oh, where's your farm? See that rooftop? See that container? That's our farm. And that was my aha moment. I realized that these young people, first of all, they love growing food, and two, they redefined what a farm looks like. And, you know, my generation, we grew up, what does a farm look like? There's a tractor, there's a farmer, and there's a field. 
And I think the young generation that's coming behind us are super excited to continue growing food, but, but differently. You know, they, they, whether it's a container or a rooftop or whatever it is. Um, I think, you know, to grow food, uh, we're gonna need the young people and they're gonna do it differently. And that's okay. We just gotta be prepared and give them the resources to do so. We've, uh, some of the things that we've looked at in the university is how to develop green financing mechanisms and, and some new ways of trying to provide startup capital for a new generation of farmers. Um, do you see a growth? Do you think there's an, going to be an increase in this younger generation of farmers? Is there gonna be a chance? There was a huge consolidation for my generation um, during the farm crisis in the US in the 80s. Do you see some opportunities now, perhaps with some of these changes that there could be an expansion of the number of farmers? I, I, do, I do believe so, and I believe we, if we wanna protect the concept of a family farm, um, we're gonna have to make sure we um, support these young farmers in doing it the way that they think is the right way. Um, what I've seen take place in the last number of years, and it's only in the last three to five years, is more corporate farms are emerging. I mean, I, wouldn't, I think you all know who the biggest agricultural landowner is in the United States. I won't mention the name. But um, uh, every day I see uh, big funds, whether it's pension funds, private equity, getting into growing food. And uh, they're doing it in a, in a big commercial way. Yesterday, uh, the biggest bank in Canada, uh, their CEO is leading an initiative on uh, the green economy and how to feed 9 billion people. And, and so big money is getting into looking at growing food completely differently and not the conventional way that we're doing it today. Okay. I'd like to change direction a little bit. Um, I'm fascinated by the idea of cranberries as to what, from my view, my understanding is really an indigenous food from First Nations traditions of diet and their lives. And I'm interested if you could tell me a little bit about the relationship of cranberries as one example of an indigenous food, which is also incredibly nutrient dense, what we call nutrient dense. It just packs so much nutrition, macronutrients, vitamins, and, and so on per, per kilogram of, of the crop. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship of an indigenous crop and some of your suppliers uh, and, and how, how that sort of the, the cultural aspect of, of farming where there's you know, perhaps some really deep cultural attachment to the crop and the land. Um, I'm interested in that. And could you talk about that a little bit with us? I, I like the first part of your question about all the good things that cranberries are. Do you want to repeat the question? <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you know, I, I think you're right. There are three indigenous crops to North America, the cranberry, the blueberry, and Concord grape. Those are the three indigenous crops to North America. And um, I don't think we're, as an industry, um, and I think all three of them are doing an, a good enough story to talk about um, you know, the fact that these are indigenous North American crops. I think cranberry is perhaps um, um, you know, more ahead uh, of the other two, but there's still so much uh, work to be done. The things that I'm proud about in the cranberry industry, and in in, I think it's also in the grape industry, the multi-generational farmers that are there. I think um, right now, uh, there's, there's a grower in Massachusetts that is seven to eight generations, one behind the other. And, and I think that's just a wonderful story. Uh, and, you know, the next generation is getting ready. But I think um, as, 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 uh, as an indigenous crop, um, and thank you for asking the question, uh, I think we need more work in, in teaching uh, or telling our story to North American consumers that, you know, you know, it's an indigenous crop, it's a superfood, it's got a lot of healthy products for you. In fact, I think we do a better job trying to sell ourselves and market ourselves globally than we do back back home. 
So we need to make sure we continue telling uh, that story. You were talking, I guess this jumps back to some of the discussion we were having a few minutes ago about what the future of farming is going to look like. And I know that you talked about shorter supply chains, more locally produced and consumed food. And I think indigenous crops and indigenous foods potentially have a role there. Um, it seems like, what do I think we grow? What? Wheat, corn? soy, rice, pretty much everywhere in the world. We kind of force our farming to deal with the differences in climate, differences in water, differences in soil, and force it. What, what has happened in that modern version of farmers, you don't have that diversification of crops. Is there a potential for other indigenous or perhaps somewhat lost crops or food supplies in some place like North America that might be better adapted to regional climate that could could replace or supplant some of those kind of major commodity type crops and and be part of that more localized production or is that just no. a fantasy? Uh, you know, uh, I I think that uh, three years ago, if you thought there would be a pandemic, you wouldn't say you know that could ever happen, and it did. I, I think I think today, uh, yeah, I think with uh, the climate change, we're seeing areas where you could. 20 years ago, never think about growing anything. And today, you can actually start thinking about growing. In fact, your question is, uh, and you'll, you'll like this, um, the region that grows grapes for, champ for champagne is the Champagne region in France. And uh, I'm not sure uh, if you're aware, but this year they virtually had no grapes at all because of the heat wave that came through Europe this summer. And when they were tracking and looking at weather changes and temperature changes and climate change, guess where they said the best area they think in the future of going grapes for champagne is? It's got to be Yorkshire. Pretty, pretty darn close. Okay. It's, it's, it's the United Kingdom, and there I thought, go. you know, only thing I would drink would be Guinness. But, uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, it, it just, it, to your point is, um, I think as we look at food production, uh, because, uh, you know, what's going on, things are changing, and we'll see what happens. In some of our work with um, some of our regional partners in Africa, in particular, with quite a wide variety of climate, quite a wide variety of growing conditions, there's a real interest in this diversification of food supply and diversification of diet. Is is there going to be a is there going to be commercial opportunity for that kind of a shift, or are we just kind of frozen into this dominance of four main commodities that then go into a processing into a million consumer products or is there is there going to be some commercial opportunity for the next cranberry the next blueberry right i think the unleashing of how we see food being produced over the next decade decade and a half is going to be unbelievable you know you talked about africa here's an here, here's a continent that the weathers are extreme the soils are terrible and the answer isn't moving food there. The only answer is to grow food there for that population. You know, the worst thing we could do is export food because of all the climate impacts that will it will be caused. But I think you're right. I mean, this is why you're seeing billions of dollars going into ag tech today, because people are figuring out the world needs to eat, and the the the, the earth is changing weather is changing, climate is changing, and so how do you continue feeding uh, people? I was at a conference um, this past February, and it's made up of food companies and, and co-ops. And uh, the one consistent message that I heard from all of these big producers, you, you will know all of the brands and all of the big uh, farmer co-ops, uh, was around technology, and every and many of the companies there are investing in ag tech and realizing that the solution to feeding people going forward is going to be around technology. Looking at you know continents that need to um, feed themselves because that's where the explosion of population is. It's it's in you know parts of Asia and Africa, and they got to be self-sustaining. We. We talked uh, in the past, and we've had uh, discussed some of these things. Um, you've raised, you know, as a matter of urgency, the um, 
the impact of changing rainfall and water availability on farming. And I, I think particularly here in uh, you know Central California is one of the breadbasket regions in North America. Um, the impact of the drought uh, has been really obvious at, at different times over the past couple of decades. Um, are you seeing an impact you know, on cranberry production specifically, because I, I, I imagine it. I, I've, I've not been, you know, involved with cran cranberry productions. I know a little bit about corn and soy and dairy cows. Um, but it's, I, I imagine, as being a very water-intensive industry. Um, are you feeling pressure around water? And, and, and that's, probably just the sh that's probably just the beginning from the conversations we've had. This is probably going to get worse over the next decades. Yeah. What are we going to do about it? And maybe can you tell us a little bit about how you tackle it from, from your, your particular business? Yeah. Um, you know, what a great question to ask uh, in California. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, for the first time in 30 some odd years, uh, we had to wait for our harvest because there wasn't enough water. And we had to wait for rainfall. We had to wait because our 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 cranberries weren't coloring because the nights were too too hot. Um, Massachusetts, they were they were in a drought situation. So we're seeing water issues everywhere. I mean, California is really the um, conversation piece that I think everyone is having on the continent that the water shortage here. They expect within a decade to a decade and a half, a million acres coming out of production. So what does that mean for food security around the continent? And you know, my understanding is that the California uh, uh, lawmakers are talking about, you know, thinking of putting restrictions around exporting food out of California because with all of the production lost, they need to feed their own people in their own state. So that's a wake up call. I think one is um, to other jurisdictions, you need to start thinking about how you're gonna feed your people. But I think two, which is probably the most important is, is the whole water issue. It is a not an infinite resource anymore where we just think we can turn on our taps and shut them off when we want. It is becoming a critical resource that uh, we haven't paid much attention to. And California is kind of like the beacon of this is not what you want okay. in your jurisdiction. Um, and I guess some of those risks that you mentioned because of changing weather patterns, availability of water for growing agriculture, it seems there's there's also, particularly because of the, the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, you know, the impact on sunflower oil as a key food oil, the impact on wheat from that region on global markets has had a huge impact on, on prices. Um, but it also emphasizes to me how food security is starting to become very closely linked, perhaps to geopolitical instability. And I I know. Um, in Peter's introduction, he mentioned uh, you, you're advising to you know, the Canadian government. Could you tell us a little bit about how you think about food and, and you know, geopolitical security as a kind of strategic national? I mean, it's, it plays out everywhere, but as a kind of a, uh, what is the approach that, that nations ought to be taking, the link between food security and national security? Well, I'll, I'll talk as a Canadian. Um, being impacted uh, as a Canadian. Um, the geopolitical piece is, is very important, but never, you know, something that you would think would be uh, influencing uh, whether your nation is going to eat or not. We come from our geography where it's, you know, winter six months of the year, so we're limited on how much we can grow and when we can grow. And, um, and then, you know, when we had that pandemic, the borders shut, uh, people couldn't come, and that's that's another you know issue is not just climate but people as well. We couldn't we couldn't bring in uh, foreign workers. Uh, it, that was shut off. Uh, goods couldn't move freely between borders. So, you know, what would happen if uh, there was a president that said we have to stop food production from leaving our borders and we have to think about feeding America first? the significant impact on Canada would be horrendous. 
we rely so much on, on the U.S. And, and other nations to provide our food because we're very limited uh, um, on what we can grow and when we can grow it that we rely on other nations to bring our food. It would be a dramatic impact. So geopolitically, yeah. I mean, today, you know, nothing, the only thing that's certain is uncertainty. Yeah. We've covered quite a lot of fairly intense subjects, uh, availability of food, the future of the planet, lots of things like that. Um, I'm going to turn to talk about something perhaps more of a, of a success story. I love when I meet our alumni from around the world. I love the personal stories. And Peter, would you be able to be willing to tell us a little bit about just that personal journey that you've been on? How did you end up studying law at University of Leeds? And then how do you go from a law degree to growing cranberries and then, you know, having this incredible career at executive level with a major global food brand? So I want a success story uh, to, to, to end on maybe as, as um, we're getting towards the end of the sure. time. Uh, well, um, naturally, why does one person um, move to another country? It was for a girl. And uh, <laughs> I woke up one morning and realized I had three teenage daughters with Yorkshire accents. And it was because I met that girl. Yeah. <laughs> so there you <laughs> go. We, now we've got a family uh, in Yorkshire. Yeah. yeah. I always wanted to study law. I, I, um, I, my father uh, was in a partnership and uh, uh, he was involved with two individuals and those two individuals fought and my father got dragged into a lawsuit that uh, left us very vulnerable. There were two individuals that were trying to get at each other but we got dragged into the fight. And I remember looking at my father's face and, uh, and I could see he was scared. And he was scared because um, he didn't have control of his destiny. It was in a lawyer's hand, and it was two ex-partners that were fighting with each other. And I made a promise to myself that I would never allow myself to be in that position or my family business. So um, I w was going to go to law school, and it was in the summertime I met uh, a, a young lady who was studying in Yorkshire at the University of Leeds, and she told me all about it, and I got so excited. I applied, and lo and behold, <laughs> I, I got there. And, um, you know, after a few months, I never saw her again, but that was okay. I enjoyed, uh, <laughs> uh, I enjoyed my experience at the, at the university. And, um, and then I remember having a conversation with my dad. And he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, you know, eventually want to come back to the, to the farm because I love what I do. I like to grow food. It, it's something that excites me, inspires me, and, and I want to do that. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, the world has enough lawyers. We need some more farmers. So why don't you why don't you come back early? And I did, and I kind of regretted it for the first little while, but uh, it's the best decision I made. Okay. And how do you? Um, what's your? What's your? You, you, I sense that you must have almost like a personal relationship with Ocean Spray. That you kind of grew up with the company. Can you tell me a little bit about? Um, how it changed shape from when you first entered the business to, to today? Yeah, um, I was, what, 11 years old when my father invested in, into the cranberry industry with his partners. And in 1985, he went his own way. We were a small cranberry operation. And, you know, I would, every summer and every weekend, I'd be out there working on the farm with him. Um, and Ocean Spray was just this giant, food and beverage business that uh, we would sell our cranberries to and we were a part of the cooperative and um, and you know it was just kind of neat uh, just growing up and 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 just growing in, up in this uh, in this environment and getting to meet all the neat people from all different parts of uh, of North America that uh, grew cranberries as well and um, it wasn't until I came back from law school that I thought, well, you know, I can I can contribute a little bit more than just growing. I can perhaps look at you know helping the company because you know it's um, it's you know w when you ask people you know who owns Ocean Spray, people think we're big food. We're not actually big food. 
Ocean Spray is owned by 700 family farmers. And, you know, that is just a, such a great story. Uh, it's the farmers that own Ocean Spray. And I felt that I could do a little bit more. And eventually I, I joined the board of directors and, uh, in 2003. And in 2014, um, I became uh, the chairman. And I give my board a lot of credit. Uh, they, um, you know, um, it was the first time Ocean Spray ever elected a, a visible minority and a, a non-American as, as their chair. And for them, it was about the right person to lead uh, the organization into the future. And uh, so I've been, I've been the chair of Ocean Spray for now uh, nine years. It's a fantastic story, and I guess what I love is the idea of the, the, the global diaspora that comes together in one place for a period during university, and they go back out and do amazing things, um, multiple continents, multiple, multiple periods of time in your life, and, uh, and uh, I think it's one of the great things about universities is that, that ability to bring people together and, and change lives and, and change the shape and direction of, of where people go with themselves. Um, I want to encourage everybody to uh, you know, put your questions down and uh, uh, we'd like to move to some questions from the audience. Um, uh, both uh, if you've written things on cards, those of you who are uh, present here in San Francisco or those of you who are joining virtually, if you've provided questions, we'll see what they have for us. Sure. And for those that are here, there's wine, I'm, I understand, that is being served afterwards. So the, lo the more questions you have, the longer you have to wait to get a glass of wine. Just uh, <laughs> put that out there. I've got a question. This, uh, I've never had a chance to ask a chairman of a major food brand this. The US government provides tremendous subsidies to agriculture. What should change? So we're asking a Canadian what the U.S. should do to change, <laughs> especially on an election day. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I got to tell you, um, it's working really well. Uh, I wish Canada uh, did as much as the USDA did for their farmers. Um, you know, they, they really go out of their way to protect um, agriculture. Uh, whether it's purchasing, uh, if there is a commodity that's in oversupply, uh, they have government purchases and they move them to schools or to the military. Um, that's not happening in other countries. Um, but I think the, the U.S. government does a lot for its farmers. And I, I think the model that the USDA uses, in fact, you know, uh, one of the switches that they made earlier on uh, is looking at technology as well. And they, they've invested and jumped behind that. So um, I know that Ocean Spray uh, really benefits from its relationship uh, with, uh, with the USDA and uh, with the Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, and, uh, and I think we have a good working relationship. And uh, we're trying to replicate that, not just in Canada, but in, in, in other markets that we're in as well. Well, as a native Iowan, I would expect the present Secretary of Agriculture to be doing the right thing, uh, former governor of the state. Yeah, yeah, that's a good working relationship. Um, there's a, a somewhat related question, which is still around politics and, and agriculture, is how do we protect good agricultural legislation from corporate payouts to politicians that may be on either side of the political divide? Yeah. Um, well, I don't, I don't know if this was. I don't, uh, yeah. Uh, please don't take this question personally. No. Uh, um, you know, I I think the you know buying local, supporting your your farmer, uh, your farmers um, is going to be a big piece of this. Um, but let's be honest. I I, I think that today 
the challenges that farmers have are unprecedented. It's no longer what it used to look like decades ago. We have environmental issues. We have people issues. Um, and, and it's just, it's not getting any easier. It's getting harder and harder. In order to succeed today, you need to have scale. And f a lot of farmers don't have the ability to scale up. So what we're saying is um, we're saying, you know, people who have capital start coming into, um, into agriculture. And, uh, in, in, you know, over the last decade to two decades, if you've invested in agricultural land, it's been a steady increase. And I think you're seeing money, capital, saying that's been a pretty steady increase over, over time. And, uh, and, and, and I think that is, you know, um, whether it's good or bad, we'll figure out. We'll see in the next decade or two. But, uh, um, to support your farmers today, uh, it, it is it is very very hard. Just you know, just keep that top of mind. Is you know the 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 food or the 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 beverage that you're buying. Who you know who you buying it from? Are you buying it from a you know a big uh, multinational company? Or are you buying it from a farmer grown cooperative? The in helping make those changes and, and perhaps helping influence consumers to change the market demand for, for better farming methods that would, that would put some money in the farmer's pocket. There's a question here about how can companies like Ocean Spray help change consumer values to support you know, a positive response to climate change? Yeah, so um, like I said, one of the, one of the uh, hidden advantages for us is we're multi-generational. Our younger farmers are coming up and they're looking at sustainability, water preservation, uh, making sure we're telling the ocean spray story to our consumers. And, and let me tell you, with these consumers, especially the younger consumers, it's resonating. They're saying Ocean Spray is a brand that actually cares about the planet. And I think if we're really going to connect with the new consumer, it's really about being ambassadors of the planet. And uh, I think uh, we're, like I said, our, our hidden advantage is that, uh, you know, we're one of the very few commodities uh, or uh, fruits that... Uh, the next generation is continuing to farm. And they're actually leading the charge on looking at all of these important issues, issues that the consumers are looking at. You know, I had, I had one director years ago tell me that, um, you know, my wife goes to the store and she doesn't see anything she, she wants to purchase. That was a wake-up call for us that, you know, we're not touching or we're not telling our story properly. And, you know, we're, we, we've taken on that challenge and, uh, and we're, you know, we're, we're educating, I think, our consumers that we are farmer-owned. We, 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 we are sustainable. Our customers are demanding it and uh, we're, we're delivering it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we, we, look at, uh, we look at all parts of the environment. And I don't know if you've ever seen a cranberry farm, but it really looks like a bird sanctuary out there. So, mm. you know, we're really proud of what we do. Can you ex explain, can you shed any light, partly as a citizen and partly as a business person, the, the, lack, the apparent lack of urgency around setting goals to solving the climate problem and, and food security, setting goals, a lack of urgency for, you know, 2030, 2050, I, I don't get it. You know, you're, you're absolutely right. That's that, I think that's the biggest question is um, why is there a lack of urgency? I think, you know, a part of this is we're really heading off a cliff and no, there doesn't, and the thing that frustrates me the most is that the, the decision makers are, are, they have the evidence in front of them. It's very compelling, yet we capitulate and are not prepared to make the investments and the decisions that we need to to protect our food supply for the future. Yes, it's gonna require change, and some of that change isn't gonna be easy. And it's gonna require not just the consumer and leader, it's gonna take the farmers to make the change as well. But the change is necessary if we're gonna feed this planet and keep this planet healthy. We need to make these changes and investments. And, 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 and to me, the most frustrating thing is that 
the amount of capitulation that's going on. And then I see um, other parts of the world, like you see Singapore, you see the Netherlands. And you've been to the Netherlands. Yeah. Like how quickly they're changing and they're moving. And uh, uh, we need to pick up uh, our pace and move faster as well. Certainly in the work that I do, I mean, we work with governments, we work with companies, we work with NGOs, we work with community groups all around the world. And it just, my sense is, is that the messages are so challenging, the scale and the pace of change that you've been talking about so much today um, is just so daunting that there just isn't a political will to give those types of messages. Do you agree with that perception? Um, where do you, where is our politics on this? Is it, is it completely failing or do you see some progress to, to get some, you know, national governments to start to have strategic, you know, support for what is, well, we talked about national security, food security and national security. Um, where's politics? Where's the role of politics? Yeah. I think we all, I think we all ag will agree that there's a problem. I think the problem is not agreeing that there's a problem. The problem is what are the solutions to that problem? And uh, in each sector, um, you know, we'll say, well, let's let them worry about it or them worry about it and, and not start uh, participating. I think that, uh, you know, um, unfortunately, uh, the political side of it, some of their constituents are going to be tremendously impacted yeah. if these changes are made. And, um, and, and, the, and I think that's just the most disappointing thing of all is that, you know, collectively, if we need to make the right thing, uh, do the right thing, how do we do it? I'm not saying you abandon the farmers that are going to get impacted. You support the farmers that are going to get impacted. You help them transition, uh, if they can transition, into a, a different way of growing or a much more sustainable way of growing. So the responsibility is also there, but I think we all recognize that there is a problem. It's just how we're going to solve it. In my conversations with these different groups um, that I mentioned, you know, politicians, private sector NGOs, and Etc. My my perception is that the private sector gets it much better. They get that sense of urgency, and perhaps it's because the consequences are going to be felt much more sharply on their business value if they don't act. And so there's there's perhaps more planning there. Is that something you recognize, or am I just out to lunch on that one? No, I, th I think you're I think you're um, pretty spot on. At this conference I was mentioning that I was at uh, in the earlier part of 2022, it was business that was saying, we need to fix this. We're, we're, our crops are, are, are decreasing on the continent. Food demand is growing. How are we going to solve this? And um, it, is, it is business that's looking to solve this. Um, the, the Secretary of Agriculture was there, and it was really the... the the takeaway for me was the, the, the phrase that food security today is, is as important as national security for this administration. And that, to me, was an understanding from government that there was a problem. And then the business sector was trying to figure out how to solve that problem. There was one question I spotted earlier that I think comes back to this, and I'm just trying to... Just locate it here. What can farmer, farmers markets and food banks do better? What is their role in the food supply? Uh, well, farmer markets, um, nice place to go on a Saturday, Sunday to pick up your food. Uh, I think, uh, you know, small little communities, that's great, but to feed the greater public, that's, um, it's not going to solve the food, uh, uh, you know, shortage issues. Um, food banks, um, you know, something I think that's a social thing, uh, not a, not a, not a food production. We just have, uh, we just have to make sure that, uh, people are not, um, allowed to go hungry. Yeah. Okay. It's a social issue, I think. 
There's another geopolitical question here. Um, I'm not going to be allowed back in the United States. If <laughs> <laughs> it's outside of North America, actually. I think it's an interesting question. Um, what is the long-term impact of uh, future food, sec food security um, in the global south by land purchases in Africa and Latin America by wealthy countries? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't even try answering that question. I, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a subject that I have really no knowledge of. Okay, good. <laughs> and, and I don't have any knowledge. Either. <laughs> that will be a future Commonwealth Club evening uh, discussion. Um, I have one final question. Um, to ask you about, and um, it's a little bit tailored for the audience here, I think. It is, you talked about all the changes in farming, we talked about water, changes in water availability for agriculture. What is farming in Central California going to look like in 2050? And what is food supply in San Francisco going to look like in 2050? Well, 2050, I sure the heck hope the Napa Valley is still here. Because <laughs> I like wine. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I think, I think uh, you know, the urgency that is evolving out of California uh, because of the water crisis and food production and losing almost a million acres in the next decade and a half, it's going to really accelerate uh, what production is going to look like. I can see by 2050 uh, San Francisco being a kind of a, a world um, innovation uh, uh, food growing area that will be replicated in other major cities across the world. I can see uh, ways of food production that is grown here that is extremely different where um, minimal water use, uh, growing much more food on much less land, um, feeding your local markets that you're not having to move food uh, a thousand miles and bring it back. I think everything will be done here. And I think that's, you know, as you look at deglobalization, I think that's starting to look uh, in the food uh, growing area. I think that's going to take a footprint. But I think the you're going to see a lot of that accelerating here in California just because of the urgency uh, that uh, is going around on food production. You mentioned it, and we didn't talk very much about it. Um, it was one of those things that kind of slipped by without exploring it, but maybe right now is a good time to ask about it a little bit. It is, would you see a role for, the, for urban agriculture in that idea of controlled environment vertical agriculture? Are we going to see, is this going to become chlorophyll valley? Yeah. You, you know, there, there are um, already operators in California that are uh, investing in vertical farms. And, uh, and uh, you know, there's a lot of capital that's required. And as, as this uh, technology develops, um, they're gonna get better at it. But, you know, there are some crops, uh, one acre can produce um, as much as 800 acres conventionally. Uh, and, and we're seeing this technology not just developed here, but in other areas. You know, lettuce is becoming, um, I didn't realize how important lettuce is, but it's really important and everybody needs to eat lettuce and we're seeing a lot. We're seeing the, the lettuce crop in California significantly reducing. And, uh, and then there are uh, producers that have taken it from outdoors to indoors. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that I actually think is really interesting about indoor farming is going back to something I said earlier, food waste. That everything that you grow indoors is of a high quality versus when it's outside, you're subject to weather issues, disease issues, all of these different pressures uh, that affect quality and certain foods are then thrown away. And, you know, the question is, well, if it's grown indoors, it's the same as outdoor. 
and everything indicates yes it's as good so I think that is really the opportunity I think California is going to be uh, a, a big lead in this I just realized that the, the terms vertical farming or vertical agriculture and controlled environment agriculture and it may not be everyday terms for people that aren't working in agriculture and food could you maybe just describe for the audience a little bit what we're talking about sure. what a, what a, what a 2050 yeah. in, you know yeah. vertical farm in San Francisco or in the area would look like what what are we talking about sure. here so you see an Am Amazon distribution center in a big warehouse and then the warehouse next to it is growing food inside of it and it's growing a lot of food inside of it so it is um, you know in, in a way uh, instead of this factory producing widgets this factory is producing lettuce and it's of the same quality uh, and all the nutrients are in, in, in the end product. So uh, yeah, I, I think you will see uh, a smaller footprint, but you know, more of a building structure that will be growing food and processing food within. It's a, Giant greenhouses or made of glass or? Yeah, I mean, there's that, but there's also uh, the light technology okay. uh, where um, the plant is um, kind of tricked on what uh, you know what season it is in and uh, and uh, you know within what every 21 days they can take a seedling and have it into a, 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 a head of lettuce uh, and, uh, and and it's happening and the quality is very good the only problem right now is that it's not scaled so the expense is pretty high it's not as cheap as field run but as it evolves over time uh, you know hopefully it'll scale up and I will tell you there is virtually no food waste that is coming out of these okay. facilities and I think that is so important and the amount of water that is used is completely insignificant versus field run so you know and and uh, and if you're doing it and you're growing it locally and then you're sending it to your local markets, yeah. it just feels like it's better for the environment and it's better for consumers. Okay. Peter, you've been really generous with your time and your thoughts with us this evening. Um, I just want to assure you that all the really awkward questions were from the audience and were none that I, I had composed. Um, we want to let everybody know that there'll be uh, the wine and uh, refreshments outside. Peter, may I pass back to you to uh, any final comments? Is my microphone on? Yes, it is. Okay. Well, I, I just add my uh, thanks to you both for doing this. I thought it was a very interesting program. And thank you, everybody, for attending and to those that are attending virtually. And please, let's have some, continue the conversation and over a glass of wine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.